What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the 15 Minutes a Game. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit of NBA. So we're bouncing the ball around and we're past the trading deadline. We're heading into the home stretch of the season. I know us Laker fans are a little nervous about what's going on, but we're going to kind of bounce around the league today and talk about the trading deadline. So we saw some teams make some crazy moves and the landscape has kind of shifted. So I'm interested to hear your guys' takes about what kind of we're going to see and, and who you think was the biggest winner at the trading deadline. So that's my question to you. Who do you think made the biggest splash and set themselves up to make a run here uh, for the playoffs? So go ahead, Steve. What do you think? I have a few teams down, but the biggest winner to me that can do the most damage uh, were the Denver Nuggets. I think adding Aaron Gordon for so cheap, Gary Harris, RJ Hampton, and a first round draft pick in like three years, I think, uh, for a fifth place team, that's a game and a half before today behind the Lakers. Uh, I, I think it's a great, a great move for them. Their starting lineup, Jamal Murray, Barton, Porter Jr., Gordon, and Joker. That's what it's projected. That's that's pretty legit. I have I have uh, other teams too that that I thought did well. I thought the Heat getting Oladipo was a nice move. Um, they're you know they're struggling. They're sub five hundred, but the East you know if you can get in it, it you know at least you got a shot to lose to the Nets. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> and I thought the Bulls adding Vucevic was a big deal. They're a young team, tenth seed right now, but they're only two games out of the playoffs. For them, it's more, I think it's a great addition for the future to, to go with uh, Zach out of UCLA, who got the win tonight. Um, so those three, and then I was very nervous about the Lakers. I know it wasn't a trade, but they did add Andre Drummond today. So, you know, that helps a lot because we don't really know when AD is coming back. So he fills that, he fills that void and then, Hopefully he does come back before the playoffs and you, you've got those two bigs down there under the rim, you get LeBron back healthy. You know, it, I'm a lot less nervous as I was before he signed with LA. So, so those are the teams I know I, I always say a lot, but really if I had to pick one, it's Denver. Denver. Okay. I like that. That's true. I agree with you on that. But the biggest pickup for me, I would say the Clippers, sadly, picking up our guy, Rajon Rondo, uh, because on previous shows, we've talked about the Clippers lacking like that point guard, it, not experience, but that point guard leadership, directing people where to go on the floor, getting the ball out of PG-13's hands, getting the ball easy, easily to Kawhi. And we saw what uh, Rondo did for us last year in that bubble. So I feel like that's a great pickup for the Clippers, even though they, they lost their six-man Lou Will. They have, like, Terrence Mann emerging, Reggie Jackson hooping. So I feel like that was a good pickup. And I, agree, I like the Nuggets, which you said, Steve, about Aaron Gordon. He's still young and still has to prove himself, but he has been improving while he's been in the league. So that's a good pick for Joker because he's going to find – Aaron Gordon easily yeah. if they double team him or cheat. And another one, a low key one, I like the Portland Trailblazers getting Norman Powell just because Norman Powell just having his breakout season as well and giving Dame and CJ another guard with Nurkic at the post to threat to threaten threaten the defense with. And of course Vucevic with the Bulls, but Rondo's my big one. Rondo's your big pickup. You think that puts the Clippers as a team to beat right now with the Lakers all banged up? Who do you, who do you think's better now after the moves, Clippers or Nuggets? I will go Clippers. Clippers, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to go completely in a different direction here. And I'm going to say my biggest winners of the trading deadline was the Orlando Magic. <laughs> now, you're going to think, why? What are you talking about? If I'm looking at the league right now, I see one team that's clearly way better than everybody else, which is Brooklyn. And you guys may disagree with me on that or not, which is fine. 
Uh, but I see them as kind of the prohibitive favorite to win now, considering that the Lakers are banged up. So if I'm a team like Orlando, they did the best thing they could because in the NBA, you don't want to, you either want to be at the very top or the very bottom. So stacking a lot of picks for the future, they completely sold. It was the right move for them. They had whatever assets they could and they dumped them. Uh, Gordon gone, Fournier gone, Vucevic gone. So I think they made the right moves. Now, obviously, I would say of the contenders that improved, I, I think Denver did the most. Um, but I really see Orlando as a team that could set up themselves to, to draft some interesting young players in the future. I, I, I agree with you. You, know, you guys agree with that? I'm like, I'm not a big draft pick guy. Just because as we've seen with Orlando, like after trading Shaq and getting rid of Penny, like they had their stall until Dwight came and gave him life like a decade, like 15 years later. So like I feel like it's a very gambling risk with draft picks. I, I'm just like very old school. I like like winning now, you know, instead of just like wait for the future and wait for them to develop. But I hear what do you she- think, Steve? Yeah, I mean I I'm on both your sides. I, I, I get what you're saying, though, Javon. You know, they, they kind of got out ahead of it. They knew, you know, they, they traded those guys and got a bunch of draft picks. So whenever those guys were going to be free agents, they weren't staying. Or, Orlando's, you know, not very good. <laughs> and Orlando is not Miami. You know, people don't go rushing to play. Right. That's the other thing. Is Orlando it's not Magic. A- so, yeah. Uh, I, I think down the road it's 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 a it's a good deal for them or good deals for them, um, but yeah, overall I still think you know the most improved team after all of this is is Denver. But I don't disagree with with the point you're making at all. Sure, sure. Well, that's good to hear uh, hear you guys' takes on that. One thing I did want to discuss here as the producer of this show was the increase in charges that are being called in not only professional basketball but as we all know is March Madness right now at the college level so what do we think about guys stepping in and the increase in charges being called I'm sure you know we've all seen it over the last couple of years guys are not only taking charges but flopping at a higher rate and the nba hasn't really done anything about it college hoops hasn't done anything about it to enforce it so uh where are we with that and how do we how do we fix this i i found a clip from a few weeks ago chris mullen talking after a warriors blazers game where draymond drove to the rack thought he scored but they called a charge uh lillard took a charge he was just outside of the uh, restricted area at the end of the game at the end of the game. Yeah. And Chris Mullen hates the rule. Um, it was just one of the things when I was looking up things about charges this season and last season, he wants it moved outside the paint only. So basically no charges called inside the paint. His sentiment was similar to what we've talked about in the past, basically that, you know, if, if you're taking the charge and you, and you fall down or you fly, you're, you know, you're getting that call like 70% of the time. So he would like to see it, you know, not dictate games. Cause at the time, I believe it was the game tying shot uh, for, for the warriors. So yeah. I just thought that was interesting. An interesting take by an old school, you know, all-star player like Chris Mullen. And he played in the physical era, too, yeah. where hand checking was allowed. So uh, that's a very interesting concept. I just feel like I hate the charges where you're driving and I'm passing it out to Steve, but I run into the defender and they call a charge then. And just little things. So I, like, I feel like refs, how they have the challenge now in basketball, NBA, even though it's one challenge, they need to up it more because refs, they're human man they make mistakes just like that Lillard play like Lillard is sometimes sneaky and they will get in front of you at the last second so it's like where can that offensive player go like it's you can't just put on the brakes just like that so I'm not a big fan of the charge charge thing um I like how the NBA and NCAA they're penalizing players now for flopping just like trying to get that out the game like in college if you flop you get a warning but if you flop again you get a personal foul 
in, in, in the NBA, like Kuzma and LeBron sadly got warmed by the league. I feel there's way more players like Marcus Smart and some more players that need to get uh, fined and warned of doing the same thing. Yeah. I, I can't stand seeing games being decided by refs and players just stepping in and taking a charge and the ball gets turned over to the other team. So I think it is a big problem. And the NBA is dealing with an issue in ratings, not saying this is the, the sole reason or anything, but stuff like this is, is a reason why some people don't want to watch the NBA because they feel it's gotten too soft. You know, the refs have kind of let <laughs> super um, soft. Yeah. The refs have kind of stepped in and, and are able to, um, take over games. I'm not saying they're they're doing anything shady or, or whatnot, but um, protecting yeah, players, I, certain players. They are, and and some of the the rules I do like, where you can't step underneath players to, you know, contest a jump shot, things like that for oh, player wow. safety. But I just see guys stepping in now, and it's like you're putting your body at risk too when you do that. I get it, but it's it's not really a basketball play in my opinion. So that's that's what that's what is kind of bothering me about. Um, the game right now yeah the NBA is just so much softer when I you know be on my phone or whatever and you'll get the alert from ESPN about how there was like a, a fight in whatever Celtics Pistons game today and then you go and click on you click on it to watch it right and there's no fighting it's literally like <laughs> my my fifth graders that I work with push and shove more than what goes on in these quote unquote fights, you know, stuff like that in the eighties and nineties, that, that was going on in practice every day. You know, they were throwing punches in practice. I'm not saying it needs to be like that in 2021, but no, no, you know, but it, it's, it, it, it is soft. Uh, it's, it's just way different. Than- Even Kelly Oubre was saying like, he, I guess he's tired of hearing the goat statement. So he's saying you can't basically claim a goat in this era because the, it's a, a soft generation, soft decade of basketball in the NBA. So I agree with them. Like from 2010 to 20, it got very, very soft and very touchy. Like in 2000, Chris Childs and Kobe are throwing punches on the floor. Shaq is throwing the ball at Dudley, shoving them. So <laughs> yeah, and dudes still got to stay in the game and play, you know? Exactly. And you it's, can't celebrate after a dunk or a block, which is sad. Yeah, yeah. And that, like takes a little bit of the human element out of the game. I feel like, you know, and the basketball is, is, is a little bit about showmanship and getting in a dude's face. And I don't know. I mean, that's, here's that's just here's a removed. perfect example of what I just said. I should have brought up Sixers Lakers the other night. Dwight got kicked out because, <laughs> you know, and he was bumping into Trez on purpose, but like, dude, that legit happens in, well, when we were playing rec ball, that happens all the time. Exactly. You know? So it's like you're tossing somebody because he bumped in and then Trez kind of pushed him away. Like it should be maybe, I guess, if you want to warn him, but it definitely should not be uh, a, a second tee and you're, you're kicking him out of the game. It's just so silly. So It's a contact sport. Yeah. <laughs> so are there sinners and bumping into each other, being it's, playful? It's Yeah, exactly. My yeah, boy Tenda will be, will be really happy because he – he said, when are you guys going to talk about how soft the NBA is? So, <laughs> Tendo, there you go. And we all agree, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, in, uh, in the spirit of physical basketball, I have a little game here to close out the show. So, we're going to go with who is this guy. Perfect. And we got a this minute guy left. is leading the league in blocks per game. Uh, you only get one chance because I, I know it's a short oh, list probably in your head. So, who is it? Miles Turner. Steve blocks per game. The, the average. Yeah. Blocks per game. Is he a, he's an East coast Easter conference player. J- Come on. The, the list is short, man. I don't know. Well, Julian already said miles Turner. I'm going to go. Uh, geez. I'm going to go Dwight since I mentioned him earlier and he played. Not even go Rudy Gobert. Oh, I forgot. No, uh, nah, it was miles Turner. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Psyched you guys out for a second. Yes, you did. Good one. Hey, everyone. One. Thanks for listening to the show. You can follow us on social media, TikTok, Instagram, and Apple Podcasts. 
You'll find plenty of content there for you um, talking all things sports here. So 15 minutes a game. Thanks for listening.